over. Oh, I have to have it on my tail. Thus, an awkward fight scene breaks out. Awkward enough. 
sounds like when Coyote returns to find him in the middle of it all, his claim that they're trying to kill him is less than convincing. Either way, she's going to go on that cruise alone <laughs> now. The women still wanted to show them what he's got, though. You'll find out what I've got. Scanning the terrorists, the 
to a couple of kids who just so it happened to be in the oh arcade. So right. with news of the whole terrorist attack, they decide to take their handy dandy transmitter and transmit, sending information through the airwaves. They call for help. In the meantime, McDonald is stealing everyone's money in the most evil way possible. Bakara! Ah, the nine. Bye bye. <laughs> Seems a hell of a lot harder than I remember it. The plan to beat and kill everyone runs into a bit of a speed bump, though, when our handsome card shark takes the seat and proves unbeatable. This stalls things long enough for City Hunter to slip in. But wait! <laughs> Hello there. I bet you'd like to find City Hunter. I would. Say it. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, this is giving me strong enough diehard vibes. You don't have to have the incompetent guy try and bargain with the bad guys to save his own ass. <laughs> oh, forget it. So... I don't understand anything Okay, that felt here. a lot weirder than the Bruce Lee scene. Um, now, City Hunter just stuck in front of the camera anyway, so in order to save him, Gambit, uh, Gundam, throws his ninja cards and causes enough commotion for a firefight to break out. Ryo gets Kyoko to relative safety before swooping down, riding a dolphin, shooting his way into battle. <laughs> However, it's now he learns that Kaiori was in fact taken <laughs> away <laughs> by the greased up badass Gary Daniels. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that, that's creepy. That's creepy. Well, on the plus side, chances are up that YouTube might actually not demonetize this video. At least up until that advertiser unfriendly bastard Jackie Chan shows up. Kaori then, uh, you know, tries to act like she and bad guy are dating or something, but only to get Ryo's blood what? boiling, which comes to a peak <laughs> when he sees that guy hurt Kaori. How dare you? That's my girlfriend! Does that mean? Maybe she got her head a bit harder than I thought. themselves. This means they need guns, which she has in her room, so they need to get there, but a bad guy is in the way. No worries, she can send her smoking hot friend to distract him with seduction. And ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. It's true, I have finally found the Jackie Chan movie that YouTube is going to consider suitable for all advertisers. The joke here is the reason the guy beat the crap out of her is because he doesn't swing that way, and thus it comes down to our purpose oh character to oh God, no. that libido to good use. The lady's not going to save his ass, but he's not getting nothing out of this. Ah, the fear give me that butt attack. With that taken care of, they have access to Anna's room and Anna's arsenal. Now loaded for bear, they split into two groups. One to save the hostages, one to save City Hunter. Where is Rio exactly? On deck, about to be executed by a firing squad. Then I'd like to have one last wish. Sure. Go pick me up a sandwich I really need to eat. <laughs> Man's clearly insane. Let's put him out of his misery. So is the movie trying to make me side with the bad guy? Too bad for Rio. Seems his last meal is going to be lead. But not so fast. The ladies have shown up to stop them. First, Kyoko tries negotiating, saying her father is rich. So name the price for Rio's freedom. McDonald just figures now we can hold her hostage too, so Anna's friend engages in plan B. <laughs> The strap will lift the it takes long enough for the heroes to slip away. Unfortunately, Anna is also there and ready to actually shoot some bad guys. This allows for a decent amount of action scene, shooting back and forth while Kyoko pulls a Lost World maneuver and defeats another mini-boss with the power of acrobatics. Eventually, the big bad is sent back under deck with the arrival of the Thunder Strikers. These badass officers can easily mow down the Red Pajama Gang, so it's time to pull out the big guns. <laughs> Huh. I didn't know Fisher Price made C4. Their final <laughs> contingency is the burden of the entire boat. But City Hunter can stop them oh, if he can get his hands untied. However, before that, he winds up in a fight in the arcade with that sexy bastard Gary what? Daniels and is promptly electrocuted. <laughs> scene, which is the big reason that you must check out this movie. This is it. Daniel's hurricane kicks his ass, but it's not over yet, as Jackie Chan picks his character, E. Hyundai, and gets to work. Hunter can't <laughs> start <laughs> him. Can't toss him aside, but he has returned torpedo, wax into the wall, taking him out of the fight. But what's this? The kids are still here. Now, Gile, okay, as now. I'll see. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Say, Tiger, that's Sagat. Oh, Balrog fucking kicking a guy. 
Like, Sega Nesma. 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 Nes
business execs have to vote on something, their hands are always attached to strings like puppets, agreeing blindly with whoever's in charge. You can easily connect that to the spineless sense <laughs> of some corporations. I like and Ricky's transformation from selfish top-of-the-world star to literal freak of nature offers an arc that's not super deep, but does carry some satire of celebrity lifestyle. I'm not saying this is symbolism along the lines of Animal Farm or anything. I'm just saying, even a film intending to be mindless, if it goes far enough, can have some nuggets of solid knowledge as well. But that does raise the question, how did this film ever get made? And with a style this year, really 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 so yeah, very much. I don't know. Give me a second. <laughs> All right, Douglas, are you ready to win the grand prize? All you have to do is a Stamps.com sponsorship and a Miyagi sponsorship in under two minutes. Okay, go! Are you s***? No, that's actually my head. I think I got it. The film was originally conceived by Winter and Stern as a type of surreal horror film starring butthole surfers. I thought this was a set of but you didn't need butthole surfers to weird this up. Though no studio would take their film, they eventually developed a series for MTV called... No, they're one of my all-time favorite bands, that's why I'm geeking over this. The Idiot Box, uh, a sketch show that honestly is like shorter versions of the film. Don't miss the Idiot Box! Hey! 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 Oh! Watch the Idiot Box, folks, because Alex would have wanted it that way. It's not difficult to believe the same people worked on both of these. One of the shows, Tim <laughs> Burns, reworked the script to make it more like, well, the show they were currently working on, and it eventually got a bite at 20th Century Fox. The head of the studio, I think I said, <laughs> this is a horror film starring the band, but... Stern is a type of surreal horror film star wow. on the band Butthole Surfers. I don't know the sentence I would say, but you didn't need Butthole Surfers to weird this up. Though no studio would take their f punch, he issued a but neither Winter nor Stern had directed a Hollywood movie before. Correct, the film. Which wasn't obscene, but was a little. No, it wasn't. Uh, I'm out. Okay, yeah. one of the actors in Crime Freeman, uh. He goes by the name Mako. Yeah, yeah, he, he voiced General Iroh on on Avatar. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> his last role was actually in the 2017 TMT movie before he died. Oh, yeah. may he rest in peace. He did break a um, tribute to him in that movie. It's, it's crazy, not so. difficult to believe the same people worked on both of these. Yeah. One of the shows. I'm just reading the comments. The, 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 the show they were currently working on, and eventually got a bite at 20th Century Fox. The studio at the time, Joe Rod, loved the idea and predicted it was going to be a big hit. So he gave them 12 million dollars to direct the film, which wasn't obscene, but was a little odd. Either Winter nor Stern had directed a movie before. A lot of the names in it, none of them were quite big enough to guarantee ticket sales. But Roth liked it so much, he issued a comic book, novelization, and even action figures to be released with it. I guess he just really had high hopes. Everything they wanted seemed to be coming true until one little snag occurred. The studio head of 20th Century Fox, Joe Roth, was fired, replaced by Clayton Sherman. He apparently took one look at the script and said, Aw, hell no. And gutted the film's post-production budget. This is another reason why practical effects can be so important, because, well, a lot of what's amazing about the movie is on film. No CG had to be added later. Still, this meant a lot of post-effects had to be trimmed down or cut altogether. But thankfully, because of the film's mix of strange styles, they didn't take away from the experience at all. Some scenes looked a little odder than usual, but no, it's just part of the course at this point. To make things worse, though, the movie tested poorly, so Fox pulled the film from a nationwide release and cut its advertising budget, meaning there were no commercials or newspaper ads. This resulted in the film bombing hard, and it's no wonder. It sounds like it was targeted for assassination the second studio heads were switched. Pieces of shit like this getting ads and wide releases, this was the one they were too embarrassed to promote? Needless to say, most people didn't talk about this movie because most of us didn't even know it existed. Years later, the two directors would move on to direct a wide variety of projects, and many of them were quite good. It's ironic Freak is about a former child star because Winter would actually direct a very good documentary about former child stars. Stern as well would take a retro path, directing several episodes of the hit show, The Toy That Made Us, among other successful series. Freak, however, would only seem to fade into the darkness of obscurity. Well, for a little while. Despite DVDs and Blu-rays being incredibly difficult to come across, people are slowly as one of the really is one of those films where you have to go off of Always near food. It's not hard to do when you are the snack boarded. What's that? <laughs> I feel like a lot of times the one dude with the good head on his shoulders goes on to own the place if it stays open long enough. I just never really got why these places would agree to go on Kitchen Nightmares to get their place looked at. If they're just going to ignore everything the expert says they have to do, then not all the owners know that they're going on the show or some shit, so they're salty and that's why they pull excuses out of their ass. I don't know. I haven't watched the full episode recently. Shelly? Huh? Can I have a two seconds, please? Okay. Uh, all, all of you. So, all of you. 
was telling him to say like almost like that uh, German thing. You know, they've caught people saying shit they were trying to hide from the cameras multiple times. First it was the pigeon, and now it's all this mice talk. Genuinely, how are they getting that good of mic quality for it? Do they hot mic the entire restaurant whenever there's a new episode? I feel like I'm watching people who have been caught in the middle of mafia warfare or espionage or some shit. Like the restaurant is actually a mob front and the cops have had it monitored for weeks, and that's where all the audio is coming from. If you told me that was a piece of overcooked French toast, I would believe you no questions asked. How do you make a piece of meat stand on its own like that? I'm going to skip the easy dick joke on this one. Instead, I'm going to <laughs> use the tried and true method of how you make a sock stand up on its own. Either you cast it in resin or layers and layers of semen until it hardens. Okay, well, Jason, if you got to stand up, that means it's hard. I'm not the fool. So I see you had a chance to taste the pork chop. Can you imagine if too hard just meant a little yeah, rock? Gordon tries to take a nice little bite with his dentures, and then he ends up shattering every tooth in his mouth. He crushes his teeth to sand, and he starts choking and coughing on what used to be his teeth, and he looks like he's hacking up sawdust. If you were the restaurant that cost Gordon Ramsay his teeth because of how subpar the food was, it would be over for you. Like, not just for your business, but everywhere. They wouldn't even let you work at a McDonald's kitchen after that shit, man. That would be what people talk about you for every day of the rest of your life. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm not going to sound. It's dry it doesn't. <laughs> it looks like having a mouthful of sand was right on the money. I don't care what my boss says to me. If I'm the cook who made a meal Ramsey hated, I'm avoiding him for as long as possible. I know it's inevitable that he'll find me and chew me out, but I'm going to keep my face for as long as I can before he blows it off with the boom of his voice. You can already see it slatted off this poor girl's skull in that last clip. Look how beaten down she seems from that Sahara Desert comment. Anyways, literal murder seems like a good way to end off any video with Gordon Ramsey in it. I'm going to wrap this one up here. Be sure to drop a like if you enjoyed. There's lots of kitchen nightmares and nightmare material out there, so if you guys want to see more, let me know. Uh, let's say 20,000 likes and I'll do another. Also, subscribe with notifications on. It would mean so much to me if you did. It actually would. Remember, don't go after anyone I talked about today. It helps nobody and is a waste of time. You can follow me on twitch.tv slash quite, where I stream on Monday. Oh, no! Started off as a stunt double for the Please tell me this is a better one. Fury, but would later become it's a crazy stunt coordinator, stunt. director, and of course, actor, starring in too many films to even count. Some now, of the from his from movie, Who Am I, is pretty good. good. Project A2. He has a great sense of humor, but the truth behind his work is no laughing matter. Jackie Chan is not yeah, a stunt double stunt, for special effects. When he does a stunt, he really and he sings, does. Apparently. And he broke just about every bone in his body. And oh, yeah, yeah right there, yeah. He literally broke back on that. He broke it right there. This is my personal top ten list of what oh. I find to be his best stunts. Now, this is from an audience perspective. This is no official list whatsoever. These are picked by just me as a fan. The stunt that nearly killed him was actually a quite simple one by Jackie's standards. The armor of God, while jumping onto a tree branch, fell hit his head and had to have brain surgery. To this day, he has a plastic plug in his skull. Oh, an God. Injury. So kids, don't try this at home or anywhere at all. I didn't this know is that. top ten Jackie Chan stunts. First strike, Jackie snowboards down a mountain slope, sails off the edge and catches onto a helicopter. Just then, an enemy pilot fires, Jackie lets go, the copter explodes, and Jackie falls into the frozen lake below. Not bad, but we're just getting started. Number nine, just weeks after falling from his near fatal stunt in Armor of God, Jackie leaps off a cliff and lands that safely on a hot air balloon. Number eight, a spinning bungee jump from the movie Who Am I? Makes me sick just looking at it. Number seven, hanging for dear life on a rope ladder from a helicopter. From Police Story 3 Supercut, Jackie gets an aerial tour of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, smacking into buildings, crashing through signs, and just getting flown all over the place. There's no green screen here. He is really hanging 1,000 feet in the air. Number six, again, from Who Am I? After a spectacular fight on a rooftop, Jackie makes a daring escape. Just look at that drop. Oh, yeah, this is a good And here he goes, sliding down 21 stories. It actually looks kind of fun, but I would try it. In a sequence of high angles, low angles, helicopter shots, falling feet first, head first, Jackie makes this look as impressive as possible. Cut for time, let's just look at the end. Now that's scary. All right, skate or die, number five, from Winners and Sinners. This is one of the most death-defying scenes ever to be done with roller skates. Holding on to each car, Jackie races his way through the There are skateboarders that will do this method of, out. like... Oh, yeah. Let's get your truck. Yeah. Why not? Watch it go. They're, they're, but they're able to do it. Under under under. But roll or... Oh. The whole scene finishes off with a 50-car pileup that lasts over a whole minute of total screen time. Oh, was that real, too? Probably. Damn. Number no. four from Police Story 2. <laughs> he jumps from the ledge of a building onto a truck and from the truck to the top of a bus. Seen, uh, the last one, the top one. Then come the signs, over and under. And just to finish it off, jumps through a sheet of real glass. Damn, that's gotta hurt. 
Number three, oh. Chris, from the first police story. Chasing after some bad guys, he grabs on with an umbrella. Not bad. Pretty awesome, but that's not enough. Not for Jackie Chan. He then climbs up to the window, and that's where it really gets started. Dude, you're sick. The other actors in the scene also need to get a mention. When Jackie stops the bus, three guys crash through the window. All right, I am back. They were supposed to land on the car. I had to do stuff. Unfortunately, the bus stopped too short. Number two, the clock tower oh. dropped from Project A. Inspired by Harold Lloyd and Safety Last, Jackie decided oh, yeah. to do his own take on it. This is just frightening to watch. In fact, it took Jackie seven days before he finally summed up the courage to do it. He told his stunt team to go away and leave him hanging, literally. So he just held on until his fingers naturally slipped off, and from there, dropped 60 feet to the ground. Now, there's no trick photography, no strings, no mattress, nothing to soften the fall except for those two arms. Ugh. It's as real as it looks and as crazy as that. Oh, he wasn't satisfied oh with the first take, so he did it That's gotta hurt. times. Yeah, it's Jackie. Oh, 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 hopefully he had Jack insurance. Is, and after this dropping one. 60 feet, why not 100? Hey, why just drop it? Right why not break through a whole bunch what? of electrical lights, smash ah. the glass ceiling, and then hit the floor? Yes. Just look at them all hunched down like some crazy animal. Just imagine the adrenaline. Like, what could be going through his mind? Probably, I'm about to die. If it's not the fall, it'll be the electrocution. Well, not only did he suffer both electrocution and serious injury to his back, but he also burned off all the skin on his hands and dislocated his pelvis. Ooh, ouch! Ouch! The stuff ouch, really ouch, paralyzed ouch. Sure, it looks fantastic. That's okay, the pelvis. What a oh, price to pay. Yeah, lucky for yeah. him, he survived, and lucky for us, Jackie Chan is still Miss with Chan us must not year after year. After 40-some years of abusing his body for the sake of entertainment, Jackie Chan is the king of all action heroes because he laughs the Grim Reaper right in the face. And while he's at it, he makes some of the most exciting films of okay. all time. Agreed. Okay. Morgan, a lot of hand -hand if you combat, got... Uh, and most likely, you're in the martial arts cinema. And then, you're most definitely into... Uh, uh, no, no, continue. I thought it was over. Uh, yeah, it's lunch. whatever. This must be the show. I should one. buy my sport clothes for tomorrow. <laughs> this must be like so oh. like, you know, like action movies, or no fights. Ones, a lot of hand to hand combat. Then most likely, you're in the martial arts cinema. And then, oh, you're talking about There's two different Just masters. the term of Jackie Chan movie is like its own subgenre. After all, he's made so many films, it's hard to count. And almost all of them contain some of the best fight choreography and use of props you'll ever see. So that makes it even harder to pick a top ten. But anyway, it's not an official list whatsoever. These are all fan picked by me and me only. Check it out. This is top ten Jackie Chan fight scenes. Number ten is going to be the playground scene from Police Story 2. So awesome. The layout is just perfect for a fight. The only thing disappointing is that he never uses the swings. Number nine. Chances are, if you're watching yeah. this, you probably know the oh, line. I'm so sorry that. Movie, the Street Fighter scoop from City Hunter. Ken, <laughs> Guile, and Dawson all make You definitely have to watch Fire breath, flying oh, kicks, right. Hadoukens, and sonic booms, are complete with the original sound effects, are all Yeah, I've done it on YouTube. Jackie Chan even plays Dub. Chun Lee. Yes, Jackie yeah. and Drag. It's an affectionate parody of the game series. <laughs> and this scene alone is way better than the Street Fighter movie. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, Number eight, the bicycle chase from Project A. This is another scene that probably wouldn't make it on a list like this, but I just had to put it there because it's really funny and reminiscent of the early silent comics. God, I love that. Number seven from Meals on Meals is going to be the one-on-one -on -one fight with kickboxing oh, champion Benny the Jet. For its time, it was considered to be the most excellent fight scene ever put in film. The kicks are so swift, one of them actually puts out the candles. No trick photography. The choreography oh, is brilliant, shit. and there's good use of slow motion. Bam! Look at that. Number six is from Gorgeous. Yeah, from one of Jackie's more recent movies. In this movie, he fights Bradley James Allen, a younger and faster opponent. Every action star has that time when their age starts to catch up with them. But Jackie proves that he's still got what it takes, meanwhile giving this guy the chance to show off his impressive speed. He's one of the best of Jackie's opponents, and there's no chairs or props being thrown. It's just Wait, who is this opponent? Fight. Number five has got to be this prop extravaganza. Because first Jet Lee was quite Dragon quick. Heads, boards, when he did his stuff, when he turned on the kiss of the dragon, they had to slow down so it seems like he was going well, so well, fast, and I was like, oh, wow. Well, the four, the final fight scene of the police story. Jackie and his team basically no, 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 I mean, destroyed a shotgun. No, what I'm saying is, I'm just thinking of somebody else who, and acting that has also done martial arts and is pretty good at it. I mean, not necessarily Jackie Chan levels, but close. So many of the cuts that you see on the actors are real. Also, Number I think that was Bridget Fonda, one of Bridget Fonda's last movies, two, and then she just US quit S acting. After taking down lots okay. of bad guys, he fights the big boss one-on-one. -on -one. The 
Dillon was played by no, Jack Hamas and Buddy Dillon. And this guy knows how to kick. Holy shit. Jack Hamas really hits his ass in the And there's one part where he actually lands on some hot coals. And of course, this is real. No special effects. So he really does Ouch. Mean, and that's what makes this it so We want to see the hero rise up to the challenge. Urban Dictionary. If you look at the Jackie Channel, Urban, Urban Dictionary, it says a, per a person who can defeat nine people with a broom and a shoe. And I loved it. And I believe it. And I told that to Mom, and she would believe it too. Number two is the end fight in Dragon Lord, in which Jackie and his friend take on this one guy. <laughs> oh God, they get their ass beat. And now it falls <clears> and he's just jaw dropping. Especially Jackie. What makes the scene both exciting and hilarious is Jackie's persistence to win a much stronger adversary. He just doesn't stop. The fight starts on the ground, moves up to the balcony, back on the ground again, and back up to the balcony. It's crazy. I can't even explain it. The whole thing oh, lasts about family. twelve minutes. Twelve no freaking minutes. Freaking way. By a certain point. Jackie's fallen off so many times that he doesn't even care. He just wants to get his opponent to fall, too, even if they have to both go down together. And I know what we're all thinking right here. This is really underrated. This is the oldest Jackie Chan film to make the list. But it goes to show, since Jackie's young body really takes on a lot in this one. It's not one of his best movies, but it sure as hell is one of his best fights. Oh, my God. <laughs> I and here we go. You still with me? Number one, Dragons yeah. Forever. All I can say... Holy shit. This fight scene is so damn good, it gives me a headache. Jesus, I can't even watch it without making some kind of verbalization. Like, ooh, oh man, when somebody falls, you feel it. There's no bullshit cutaways or anything, you see everything. The slow motion shots are awesome, bodies fly in the air, windows are broken, overhead shots, and three fights going on at the same time, which are Jackie and his two brothers from the Drama Cat, Ben Q and Samuel Hunt. It all finishes with another one-on-one -on -one <laughs> battle between Jackie and Benny the Jet. Everything you want to see in a fight happens here. So oh, much God, shots, spot choreography, piles of boxes get knocked down, and all kinds of shit being broken. This is where it's at. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> go watch some of these right now. Don't so kick your ass until shit comes out your ears. I swear, I gotta get a new spring for it. Oh, you're playing guitar? <laughs> No, I'm just getting the old... Are they tuning it? I see Godzilla! Yeah, it's my only other... I see Godzilla. Wait, also, wait, wait, boy, wait. Also, it's her birthday for you, Morgan. <laughs> wait, is that Godzilla or not? No, these are the Godzilla thons you did. I like Godzilla. Morgan, did you hear me? So did I. I, I said I it's my birthday for you. I was born in 2004 yeah. through 2008. <laughs> I was fascinated. That's when I learned. Yeah, honestly, with I have the first, the very first guy who will come on Blu-ray, the original. I really monsters. don't care for Blu-ray. I do have, I don't have the entire, I have a good amount of DVDs. I only got two Blu-rays and a bunch of DVDs. I got, I got one of DVDs. I Mega Zest 5, uh, my Snapdad ordered uh, King Kong like vs. Megalon on VHS. Um, yeah, there's like 30 plus guys who will they're like getting them all because half of them you don't even know about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Better Toho? Yeah. yeah. There's some movies that haven't really. There is some that didn't ever show over here. Obviously. Do so you know that one song you've seen everywhere from. Um, I think it was an old song from the Backyard Against? Wasn't it called, like, um, Into the Something? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Well, <laughs> good. well, here's the thing. Some. Two. Three people. Watch your four people that I used to listen to did a cover of it. Yeah. And I'm just not, I don't know if I want to listen to it or not. <laughs> no, I'm going to do it. I don't care. I'm going to listen to this. And the song's like not that long, anyways, either, so. I'm not ready for this. I don't know. Oh, it's a, it's a rock cover! Okay. It's a rock cover. Alright. This doesn't sound bad, actually. Hey, Morgan. What? I know a movie that's so bad. No, no more. Whoa. No more. Warriors of Virtue. No. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, the song is two minutes long. Never mind. I thought it was shorter than that. Uh, is that I'm bad? just going to say, if you want to see bad kung fu with Muppets, Warriors What? Virtue. <laughs> it was actually, that cover wasn't pretty bad, actually. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what am I doing? 
close out this year's Monster Madness, I'd this say I left the best for last. Uh, We've had mummies, George Romero Frankenstein, movies. giant monsters, <laughs> aliens. It's just <laughs> fitting that we had no zombies. And there's no zombie series. Highlight happens when the blades of the European version and the hate. Yeah, then but... there's the head scientist. Get ripped out. His voice. He's actually he was actually born in Colombia. His His dad is Italian, I think his mother is Mestiza, which is a Mario Brothers movie. Luigi is a category. It's a Super Mario Brothers reunion. Anyway, Luigi, I mean Cholo, gets his hands on a giant killing weapon called Dead Reckoning. Strangely, that was the working title of the film. It's like a giant train that shoots missiles. At first I hated this thing and thought it made the movie feel too much like a comic book. But now, I don't mind it. Uh, it's pretty badass. I'm a Cholo threatens Kaufman with this thing to make him a shitload of money, or else he's going to aim his missiles at Fiddler's Green. He said castle. Uh, that mean like Bowser's castle? On the outskirts of the city are a group of zombies led by one known as Big Daddy, who's growing in intelligence, and decides to leave them all. I know, when I was like, how is it? Throughout the film, they keep getting closer. We follow their progress as if they're on a great adventure. With Cholo ready to fire missiles at the city, and the zombies closing in, climax and all hell breaks loose. The zombies break into Fiddler's Green, which by the way is the worst glass break ever. I think the most disappointing part of the film is the gore. Each of the dead movies up the ante on the gore, so I felt this one should have done the same. And yes, it is very gory, but I think because it's the fourth movie, the kill should have been more creative and over the top. That's just my preference. Even with the uncut version, I didn't notice any difference. I'm sure there's extra frames here and there that the shots go on a little bit longer, but it's nothing noticeable. It's just as disappointing as the uncut version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Also, a lot of the blood is computer generated. It looks like a Resident Evil video game. Oh, yeah, it does. I miss the bright red hyper-realistic blood from Dawn of the Dead. There are some great highlights, but they're brief. My favorite is the grenade kill. This time, the effects are not done by Tom Savini, but Jesus instead Christ. by Mike Toretto, who worked under Tom Savini on yeah, Evil he did. Dead, so it's the perfect transition. And in between that time, he I worked on a lot of horror films, like Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and From Dusk Till Dawn. Tom Savini does a cameo. Dusk Till Dawn is awesome. I saw it, I wonder, is this the same character he played in Dawn of the Dead, now as a zombie? I'm carrying him as a zombie. You know, I mean, what could I do? Stuff down your throat? You know, I mean, right there. Well, imagine that as a zombie, and you've got Land of the Dead. So, basically... Duh, it is. It's the first recurring character in a Romero zombie movie. This is much darker than the earlier films, and I mean that literally. It's dark and atmospheric with many excellent shots. Many of them are green screened, with lots of separate elements and layers completing the picture. But it's done so well, you don't notice. It looks awesome. I didn't, the image of the yeah. zombies coming out of the water is unforgettable. Obviously inspired by Carnival of Souls. So, I've mentioned its strengths and its weaknesses. Overall, Land of the Dead doesn't match its predecessors, but it's still pretty damn good. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. I have to say, I was one of those who was eagerly awaiting Land of the Dead. It was the first George Romero zombie movie in 20 years. I was satisfied with it, I got my fix. But then, only two years later, he came out with another one, Diary of the Dead. I did not expect this. But hey, another one from the master? I'll take it. George Romero has always been one of my idols. But there comes a time when you realize not everything your idol does is gold. Diary of the Dead, once again, has no direct connection with any of the other dead films. But this one seems to step back in time when the zombie epidemic is in its early phase. We aren't so deep yet into the zombie apocalypse. People are just becoming aware of what's happening. But the original movie took place in the 60s. This one is set in the present day YouTube generation. So I guess you could say this one's a reboot. The style that sets it apart from the other dead movies is that it's one of those found footage films like Blair Witch Project and Cloverfield. It's uh oh, uh, we got shaky cam. Filmmaker Jason, who's trying to make a horror movie, but then the real life zombie starts. I want to think this was on so Thriller back in the day. The zombie crisis every step of the way with the Who here remembers Thriller? After Jason is killed, she edits all the footage together and releases it as a film. It was a film. Called the it was a, a horror I like the idea station. Of the footage style, but TV network station on Direct TV. The whole idea of that style is to make it seem convincing that what you're watching is real. The quality of the footage is way too good for us to believe it was. Well, I figured Zero Links would be familiar with it. Always in focus, I always well am. I mean, the lighting is dark, but not in an unintentional sure. way. I've oh, we watched a lot. In a cinematic I've, way, just I've, like I've seen thousands of movies. Even more baffling is the I even found out about dead, like dead snow through that channel too. It. Not 
once does the camera ever miss anything. Even when they put the camera down, everybody is always inside the frame. Every shot looks planned. They also well, at least you can see people. Cut between two angles. It's as if well, the thing is, in Frankenstein's army, you couldn't really see much. Film. Unless yeah. you paused it. Although, by the way, I do advise anybody to go and see that movie once. Frankenstein's army. Why are they not also, Very interesting. Also, the idea of cutting between multiple cameras ruins the subjective nature of a POV. There's no long takes to make us feel like we're really there. Not to mention one tiny Wait. detail. The two cameras are completely different. One of them is some kind of pro camera. The other is clearly a DVX 100, which isn't even a high def camera. Oh. Deborah calls it an HBX, but it's not. This is a more nitpicky thing. The point is these two cameras. Well, he knows those cameras. So the audio is the most inexcusable of all. Everybody's voice is 100 percent clear. Oh, order as a shut off. I'm leaving with Jason. Do you keep the house? I'll take the car. Did they ADR this whole documentary? Oh, or did oh, everybody oh. have their microphones? Hello. Then there's the music. Why would there be music? Oh, don't worry. Deborah explains it. I love the music occasionally for a fact. Hoping to scare you. This line is embarrassing. Like, really? <laughs> Did you spell it out like that? This is a horror movie. Get ready to be scared. And if you have footage of your friends being killed, how can you be so insensitive to put music in it? Then there's the don't mess with Texas girl. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. A minor thing. When one of the cameras is losing battery power, we see the battery icon on the screen. That wouldn't happen unless Deborah added it there to be cute. Most importantly, there's the acting. In these found footage films, that's the hardest part to get right. If the acting is not believable, then everything falls apart. And here, all the acting, all across the board, is awful. That's enough, Deborah. There is not one line of dialogue spoken that doesn't sound fake. Take, for example, this scene where Jason is filming in a girl's dorm and encounters a robber. What's the guy with the video camera doing in the women's dorm? Uh, security! Did the robber forget he's on video? <laughs> no satisfy any zombie man is the abundance of gore. It's all computer generated, but still does the trick. One scene that sticks out is when they meet a deaf Amish guy who communicates by writing on a chalkboard. It's an abrupt change of mood. It's a comedy scene played for laughs. I wonder why Deborah didn't add some goofy. I'm and I'm not here to rip the movie apart. I don't want to talk about every little moment that bugged me, but I can't let this go. They're sitting around listening to a news broadcast, and right when it ends, they turn off the TV. I hate that. I hate that cliche. I understand why they do it. They have the TV running here, and they don't want the sound of the TV running over the rest of the scenes. So they shut it off just for convenience. But it's one thing to do it in a real cinematic movie, but to do it in a found footage film, that's just dumb. Romero always has an agenda. Every movie he makes has some kind of message. One thing he seems to be getting at here is how people are becoming desensitized to the tragedies of the world. I can see how some people vicariously watch the tragedies of the news safe from their living rooms, but I don't understand how this applies to the filmmakers who are actually there in danger themselves. Another thing the movie seems to be trying to say is that the news on TV hides the truth. I would assume the message here is that the common people who record things and upload them to the internet are a more truthful source of information. But then the movie goes on to say that there's an oversaturation of information because everybody with a camera is uploading stuff. Scattered over the entire film is Deborah's annoying narration feeding these messages into your head. Bring our attention to our heads when we see something horrible. So what is the message? What is the movie really trying to say? It's the first Romero film where the politics and the messages get in the way of it being an entertaining movie. I respect that Romero went back to his indie roots. Diary of the Dead was much lower budget than Land of the Dead, and Romero said that he had a lot more control over it. I'm glad that he's still making movies in the 21st century, but this is one that I tend to forget about. It tried to do something different in an age that's oversaturated with zombie films, but it was misguided and didn't hit the right notes for me. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Of all the dead films, Survival of the Dead is the movie to review because I never expected this movie to exist. George Romero used to make these movies once every ten years, and now, in his old age, he cranked out three of them in rapid succession. Of all the dead films, this is the one that best fits the description of a sequel. It seems to follow the events of Diary of the Dead, and it has a main recurring character. The two things that I didn't like about Diary of the Dead are fixed this time. One is the found footage style, which I thought had potential but was misguided. This time we're back to a regular narrative style. And the other thing is the in-your-face social commentary. This time it's downplayed under the surface like it should be. It centers around people from the military who are trying to escape the zombie crisis by boat and 
and arrive at an island where people are in disagreement over how to handle the zombies. On one side, there's people who want to kill them all. On the other side, there's people who want to keep the zombies around, keeping them chained up or behind fences, in hopes that one day a cure will be discovered. I think that's an interesting idea, but it doesn't come to any interesting resolution, well, and it seems sort of like a recycling of some of the ideas in Day of the Dead and other zombie films, but you really can't blame it because there's been so many zombie movies that pretty much everything's been done already. Now for some casual observations. There's a lot of wide open scenery. It's a pleasant film to look at. It makes me think of autumn weather. There's also a lot of western movie elements here. There's a lot of dark humor as well. It's kind of similar in tone oh, to the Dead, which Romero was a big fan of. Well, there's nothing in here as brilliant as Shaun of the Dead, but it's still pretty amusing. There's some great zombie kills. It's heavy on CG. There is one moment in the background where the zombies are taking people apart. Oh. No, 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 no,